Good morning. Welcome to worship today. My name is Sandy Miller and I'm pastor here at First Lutheran Church in Hope. And again, I just want to welcome you and thank you for joining in on YouTube for our message this week. As we continue on with our series, Who Am I? Uh, from the book of Ephesians. Um, just a couple of announcements. First of all, again, I want to thank uh, all of the congregation members who returned their surveys. Almost all of you did, over, well over 80% of you returned your surveys. And last week, we worked on consolidating those, and at our council meeting on Tuesday night, we reviewed the results and came up with a response. So members of First Lutheran, you can be expecting in the mail this week a letter from us that will entail the, the results of the survey along with council's response on how we're going to be moving forward. Uh, so watch for that. Uh, the other announcement that I have is that uh, it's not too early to start thinking about a summer Bible study. Um, we're going to be doing a study by Tony Evans. We've done one of his before, Detours and loved his study. So this time we're gonna be doing the, the power of God's names. And what an appropriate study for this time when we just look to God for his power and his sovereignty in our lives. Uh, it's a six week study beginning on June 17th and if that's something that you're interested in, uh, please contact me or email me uh, and let me know so I can be sure to get a book ordered for you. Uh, lastly, we will be having Holy Communion this morning, and so I invite you to have that ready now, if you so choose to participate. I hope that you do. Um, and again, it will just be a wonderful time, and hopefully, again, in the not-too-distant future, uh, we will be meeting together as a family of God to participate in this wonderful sacrament. With that, I'll just invite you to... Have your communion elements ready, grab your Bibles, and as we begin our worship this morning, I will invite you to pray with me. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you this morning so grateful, so uh, joyous, God, um, to be your child and to be with you in your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, for sending your son Jesus to us to show us who you are, to die for our sins, to forgive us. And so, God, um, we just call upon him this morning. We call upon your Holy Spirit to indwell us, God, with faith and to open the eyes of our heart and our minds to understanding of the word that you have for us this morning. Lord, we know that you meet us individually. You meet us collectively as we watch together. Uh, and so be with us now. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O oh Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, you can turn in your Bibles. We have three readings this morning. Our Old Testament reading is from Genesis chapter 12. You can turn there with me now. I'm going to be reading from the ESV translation. And this is the call of Abraham, God's call to Abram. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning is from the book of Ephesians, and this will be our... Um, Message text this morning, but you can turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I should have had this marked. I don't know where it went. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 11. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, by which is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. 
who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you who are you are fellow citizens, with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 17. This comes from Jesus' high priestly prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was crucified. We've got three verses this morning that we're going to read, verses 20 to 23. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Moran is an Israeli Jew who grew up in Israel. When he came of age, he joined the uh, mandatory. He joined the military service. It was mandatory for him, and he joined the Israeli army. One day, when Moran was hanging out with his army buddies. A Palestinian suicide bomber blew himself up nearby, killing 22 of Moran's friends. Moran hated Arabs. When he finished his military service, he moved to California, he began to medicate his depression and his anger with alcohol, until one day a friend invited him to church. Long story short, Moran began reading the Bible and ultimately put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ but he still hated Arabs. Taz was a Palestinian living in Israel. He embraced Islam, and when he was a young man, he joined the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, with the sole purpose of killing as many Israeli Jews as possible. When he finally got tired of the killing, he also immigrated to California, where he started a successful restaurant. And it was there that a customer named Charlie used to love to engage Taz in spiritual conversations and tell him about Jesus and encourage him to read the Bible, which Taz did until he too became a follower of Jesus Christ. Interestingly, Taz began to pray, asking God that he would give him a love for Jews. And it wasn't long before a friend invited him to a conference for the purpose of bringing Arabs and Jews together. Well, one of the speakers at that conference just happened to be a guy named Moran, telling the story of how a Palestinian bomber had killed 22 of his friends. When Moran finished his presentation, Taz walked up, up to him and he said, Hi, my name is Taz. I was PLO, but Jesus Christ changed my life, and I love you. The two men embraced and ultimately became best friends. And if you're interested, you can learn more about their story in a, just a 45-minute documentary. You can find it on YouTube. It's called Forbidden Peace. Welcome to week four of our six-week series called Who Am I? Where we have been discovering that the truest identity that we can have 
is found in a relationship with, with God through his son, Jesus Christ. We've been in the New Testament book of Ephesians, and again, you can just open your Bibles to Ephesians 2. While you're getting there, I'll give you the word for this week. Each week, we've been focusing on one word that describes our identity in Christ. The first week was chosen, where we learned that we were chosen in Christ before the creation of the world. The second week was enlightened, that once we come into a relationship with Christ, our, the eyes of our heart are enlightened to the things of God. Last week, the word was alive, that while we were once dead in our sins, enslaved to the world, the devil, and our flesh, we are now alive in Christ, seated with him in the heavenlies, therefore having both the power and the authority to put the world, the devil, and our flesh under our feet. Amen? That was good news, wasn't it? Well, today, the word is reconciled. Who am I? Say it with me. I am reconciled. That when we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, and he not only reconciles us to God, but he reconciles us with other people. Last week, we talked about the formerly versus now contrast, where Paul says, this is how you were formerly, before you knew Christ, but this is who you are now, now that you're in him. And if you remember, we learned again that formerly we were dead, enslaved, and condemned, but now we're alive, enthroned, and saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, in today's passage, we have another formerly versus now contrast. And we're going to learn that formerly we were alienated, but now we are reconciled in Christ. So let's go back to Ephesians 2, and just like we did last week, we're going to look at the bad news first of who we are before Christ and how we were alienated from God and others. So starting at verse 11, Paul writes, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So in the context of this letter, we want to keep in mind that Paul is talking primarily about the alienation between Jews and Gentiles as he writes to a group of Gentile believers in the city of Ephesus. Another point of context is that up until this point, Christianity was primarily a Jewish movement. See, it wasn't until Paul's conversion that the gospel began to spread to the Gentiles. But even so, there was still this division between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile believers. I mean, there have been centuries of hostility between these two groups, and the Gentiles just couldn't help but feel like second-class citizens since they didn't have the heritage nor the religious education of their Jewish brothers and sisters. We heard Paul say that the Jewish Christians referred to the Gentiles as the uncircumcised. And if you're not familiar with Old Testament history, you know, you're probably thinking like, what the heck? That, that sounds crazy. That's really weird. So what you need to know is that circumcision was something that God commanded as a sign of covenant between God and his people. It was a sign of their chosenness, which kind of sounds exclusive, doesn't it? I mean, right off the bat, it, I, it seems as though God is intentionally creating this division between the chosen and the unchosen. And so you have to wonder, like, why would God do that? Why would he intentionally alienate people from one another? But here's the thing. It was never God's intent to alienate other people. In fact, it was just the opposite. You see, when God called Abraham, giving him the sign of circumcision, it wasn't for the purpose of alienation. It was for the purpose of mission. What was their mission? To let everyone everywhere know about the one true living God. 
We heard it in our Old Testament reading this morning. God's initial intent was that all nations, all peoples of the earth would be blessed through the nation of Israel who alone worship the one true God. Well, unfortunately, Abraham and his people neglected their calling, and for nearly 2,000 years, God's people treated their chosenness as a matter of favoritism rather than as a matter of mission, resulting in this horrendous divide, this social and spiritual alienation from the very people that God wanted to save through them. So as Paul writes this morning's text, he uses five phrases, one right after the another, starting at verse 12, describing how this alienation affected the Jews, or the, I'm sorry, affected the Gentiles. Number one, Paul says, they were separated from Christ. Because they weren't a circumcised Jew, they had no hope of the promised Messiah, and so they were separated from Christ. Secondly, they were excluded, excluded from citizenship in Israel. It's not that they couldn't have been citizens. There were a few, but it wasn't like anyone was out going out there inviting them in. In fact, the Jews worked much harder at trying to find ways to keep them out than invite them in. Third, Gentiles were foreigners to the covenant of the promise, meaning that they were deprived of all of the promises that God had given in the Old Testament. Therefore, number four, the Gentiles had no hope a future glory and blessing like the Jews did, and that was because, number five, the Gentiles were without God in the world. If anyone knew what it felt like to be alienated, it was the Gentiles. Now, of course, all of that changed when they heard the good news of Jesus Christ, but Paul says, remember. Remember what it was like when you were alienated. Remember what it was like before you knew Jesus. In fact, the word remember is the, the first word that's used in both verses 11 and verse 12. It's the only command that Paul gives in the first three chapters of Ephesians. He says, remember. Obviously, Paul wants them to remember something. What does he want them to remember? He wants them to remember what it was like to be alienated before they believed in Christ. Why? Why would Paul tell them and us to remember what it was like to be alienated from God and from others. Well, it's possible that part of it has to do with the, the fact that when we remember our former spiritual lostness, it helps us to remember God's love and grace for us. Like when I think about my life before Jesus, it, I mean, it was a mess. And so I remember that. It makes me ever so grateful for what Jesus has done for me. But another benefit of a remembering is that hopefully, and please don't miss this, hopefully it sensitizes us to those who still feel alienated. You see, remembering our own lostness sensitizes us to those who still feel alienated. Now that could be spiritual alienation where someone's not yet a believer in Christ. It could be economic or social alienation, maybe it's racial or political alienation, whatever it is, Christians of all people ought to be able and willing to understand alienation because it used to be us before we knew Christ, before we were reconciled to him. So let me ask you, how sensitive, how sensitive are you to those who feel alienated in your world? Are you aware of the situations in, when you, in which you are part of the majority group, but there are people all around you who aren't. Let me give you a couple of examples. Say you're sitting around with a bunch of young moms and you're telling story after story about how wonderful and funny and precious your kids are. Are you aware that there is a woman right there in your circle who desperately wants kids but can't get pregnant or stay pregnant? Maybe you guys are hanging out with your friends and you're talking about all the joys of owning a home and all of the home remodeling projects that you're, that you're doing, but one of the guys there just happens to be struggling tremendously with finances with hardly any hope at all that he'll ever be able to get out of his one-bedroom apartment. 
Maybe you're hanging out with a bunch of coworkers who just happen to be mostly white. Are you aware of the one Hispanic or African American person that's sitting at their desk just listening in and wishing so much that they could be a part of your conversation? I wonder what that feels like. When you're in a Bible study and you're sharing all of these amazing insights and then praying in an eloquent way, are you aware of the new Christian who is maybe just struggling to understand and doesn't understand Christianese? Now, I know that most of the time we do these things unintentionally, but let's admit it. Sometimes we do them on purpose as well because it's so easy to alienate people and treat others as outsiders. But Paul says, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, remember. Remember what it was like to be alienated. Remember who you were before Christ, alienated from God and alienated from others. So that's who we were formerly. But who are we now? Reconciled. Reconciled to God and reconciled to each other. Harold Hughes grew up as a poor farm boy in Iowa. When he got to military age, he enlisted in the Army, fighting in some of the bloodiest battles of World War II. He came home suffering from the atrocities of war, and he turned to alcohol, becoming a tri truck driver who was known for his profanity. One day, somebody told him about a higher power that could change his life, and that's exactly what happened when Harold put his trust in Jesus Christ. His life did turn around. And he eventually ran for a local political office, which he won. Over time, his confidence was built up, and a few years later, he ran for the governor of Iowa. Again, he won, and he held that position for three terms until he became a very liberal, democratic senator in Washington, D.C., where he was known as a champion of the little guy and an adamant opponent of Richard Nixon, who was currently serving as, as president. Chuck Colson was Richard Nixon's hatchet man. Chuck served as a Marine in World War II. He obtained a law degree and, and became a part of Nixon's administration, caught up in the whole Watergate scandal. It was during that time that, the, during the time that Colson was being prosecuted, um, his life was in ruins, that a friend told him about Jesus. Chuck Colson received Jesus Christ, and he was invited by his friend to attend a Bible study on Capitol Hill. Well, guess who the very first person that he met was? Yep, you guessed it, Harold Hughes, this really liberal Democratic senator from Iowa who could not stand Richard Nixon. And now he is being introduced to Chuck Colson, Nixon's, Nixon's hatchet man. Well, Hughes, being a little bit smart, he says, So, Chuck, we've heard that you've encountered Jesus. Tell us about it. Well, at first, Chuck was a little intimidated, but once he got going, the room got quiet. And when he finished telling his story of conversion, it was so silent that you could have heard a pin drop until Harold slapped his knee, and he said, Well, that's all I need to hear. <laughs> You're my brother in Christ now. And since God forgave you, I forgive you. And I love you like a brother. I will stand by you, I will defend you, and I will be there for you whenever you need me. The group got on their knees to pray. And when they stood up, Chuck and Harold embraced. Two men from very different, very hostile backgrounds. Formerly, they have been alienated. But now in Christ, they were reconciled to God. And as a result, reconciled to each other. Let's go back now and read Ephesians 2, verses 13 to 18. Paul writes, But now in Jesus Christ, you who were once very far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing 
the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. I mean, that is amazing, isn't it? Paul says in verse 13 that although we had once been far away from God, we are now brought near to God through the blood of Christ. Where we had formerly been alienated from God, we are now reconciled to God and each other. Now I know that most of you understand what Paul is saying here, but maybe some of you don't, and so let me explain. You see, we have a problem. We are sinners, all of us. Just like Chuck and Harold before they knew Christ, we are messed up, all right? And the Bible tells us that because of our sin, that we are separated or alienated from God and that the consequence of sin is death. It's spiritual death first, separation from God, which eventually leads to physical death at the end of our life. And if the problem isn't resolved before then, it results in eternal death in the world to come. But praise God, because of his great love for us, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, uh, to, to, to die on the cross, to take the penalty of sin that we deserved. And again, praise to God, Jesus didn't stay dead, but he was raised from the dead on the third day. And he offers forgiveness and new life and a relationship with God for anyone who puts their faith and trust in him. That's the gospel. And it's what Paul is saying here, that by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we can now draw near to God and have peace with him. But it's even so much bigger than that, because not only are we reconciled to God, we're reconciled to each other. Just like Harold and Chuck, who were once enemies on opposite sides of the aisle, treating each other with hostility, we can now be friends, reconciled with those who used to be vastly different from us. So let's go back to verse 14. Again, keeping in mind that Paul is talking primarily about how reconciliation works between Jews and Gentiles, but it applies to us as well. He says that Jesus has broken down the dividing wall of hostility, and what he's talking about is the dividing wall that kept the Jews and the Gentiles apart. So what exactly did this dividing wall of hostility consist of? Like, what exactly did the blood of Jesus accomplish? Paul tells us in verses 14 and 15, he says that the dividing wall of hostility came down by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Now, I know that's a, a mouthful, <laughs> so let me explain. We know that in the Old Testament that God gave his people all, these, all kinds of laws to follow. All right, there were laws about animal sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. There were laws about how to choose a priest who, who would then be a mediator between you and God. There were identity laws to follow, like circumcision and uh, dietary laws, purification laws, and laws about festivals that they were supposed to carry out, all kinds of things. 613 laws that the Hebrew, Hebrew people had to follow. And it, and it was these laws that became this wall of division between the Jews and all other people. It even went so far as not allowing Gentiles into their place of worship. The, the Gentiles could come, but they had to stay way in the outer courts, away from the presence of, of God. So Gentiles were clearly kept at a distance, not just religiously, but socially and relationally as well. So how did Jesus destroy that wall? By becoming the fulfillment of the law. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill the law. And once Jesus fulfilled the laws, they were no longer necessary. How did he fulfill them? Well, no longer do you need laws about animal sacrifice so that your sins could be forgiven because Jesus' death on the cross, his sacrifice on the cross, satisfied the penalty of sin once and for all. No longer do you need laws about a priest acting as mediator between you and God because Jesus is our high priest. And because you're forgiven in him, you now have direct access to the Father. 
All those laws about identity markers like circumcision and kosher food and festivals, no need for that anymore either because once you put your trust in Jesus, he sends his Holy Spirit to live on the inside of you which seals you as a child of God. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. That is all the identity marker that you need. So Jesus' death on the cross fulfills all of those Old Testament laws, making them no longer necessary, therefore tearing those walls down that religiously and socially, socially separated Jews from Gentiles. And friends, Jesus continues to do that today when people put their trust in him. First, he reconciles you into a relationship with God, but then Jesus tears down those walls that separate you from other people. Walls of pride and selfishness, walls of anger and discrimination. Why does he do that? Verse 15, so that he could create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So that sounds really good, but how does that happen practically? Well, let me give you an illustration. I don't know, hopefully you can see this, but here is a triangle. All right, and let's, I'm gonna move this forward here so you can see. Cameraman, does that work? Yep. Yeah, okay. So here's a triangle. Imagine, if you will, that you're over here and everybody else is all over here. You're alienated from God, you're alienated from the others. But once you come into a relationship with God, you're now reconciled to him and you start moving up this line. And I just want to be clear that the moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are immediately and fully reconciled to God. But because we're human, our experience of that takes some time. All right, so even though it's immediate, it's also a process as we move and draw near to God. So imagine now, if you will, that those on this side of the triangle also come into a relationship with God. And they too are going to start moving up this line towards God. Well, what happens? As you both move up towards God, the distance between you gets closer and closer. You, you become reconciled together in God as well. So, that is why we can say that reconciliation with God naturally leads to reconciliation with other people because you're both moving in that same direction. Let me give you another illustration, and this is a very extreme circumstance. But two years ago, a woman by the name of Rachel Den Hollander was in the news as the first Olympic gymnast to make allegations of sexual abuse against Dr. Larry Nasser, a USA Gymnastics team doctor who had been sexually abusing gymnasts for years. It was a hugely, hugely courageous act on Rachel's part because at the time, all of the people of influence in the organization were siding with Dr. Nasser. By the time the, the trial came around, there were over 150 victims who were willing to give statements, and Rachel was the last one to speak. Her 30-minute testimony, which you can still view on YouTube, it was so moving, and it immediately went viral. I'm just going to read you a, a small portion of it. She's talking directly to Dr. Nasser in the courtroom, and she says, she says, the Bible that you carry speaks of a final judgment where all of God's wrath and terror is poured out on men like you. Should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you have done, the guilt will be crushing. And that is what makes the gospel of Christ so sweet, because it extends grace and hope and mercy where none should be found. And it will be there for you. I pray you experience the soul-crushing weight of guilt so that you may someday experience true repentance and true forgiveness from God, which you need far more than forgiveness from me, although I extend to you that to you as well. Wow. 
I don't think that there's anything more alienating than sexual abuse. And, and yet Rachel holds up the prospect of grace and forgiveness to her abuser. How could she do that? Because of her relationship with Jesus Christ. Because through him, she had experienced reconciliation with God, and she knows that if and when the day ever comes that Dr. Nasser actually repents and surrenders his life to Christ, that he too will be reconciled to God and therefore reconciled to Rachel. So who are you alienated from today? Whether it be simply a personality difference or maybe it's because of, it, like in Rachel's case, some wrongdoing. Could be a family member, maybe your neighbor, could be someone at work, but here's the thing. If you both have genuine faith in Jesus Christ, you are both reconciled to God and the possibility exists for you to have peace and reconciliation with each other. In the spiritual realm, it is already done. It's already done. But Christ died that it could happen practically as well, just like it did for Taz and Milan, and just like it did for Harold and Chuck. Which leads to our last point, that because Jesus has reconciled us to God and reconciled us to each other, it is for the purpose of joining us together in relationship and mission. Paul gives us three pictures of what this looks like in the closing verses of today's passage. And the first one is found in verse 19 where Paul says, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. In other words, we're not separate entities anymore doing our own thing. We are now fellow citizens in God's kingdom, joined together for a common purpose and mission. What is our mission? It's to expand the boundaries of the kingdom of God. To tell everybody everywhere about what Jesus has done and what he's done for them. So this isn't just theoretical anymore. It's practical because when you are a citizen joined together with other citizens for a common purpose and mission, you begin working side by side with people that you otherwise may have never chosen to work with. I mean, it could be that all of a sudden, you have the opportunity to serve with someone who is totally opposite of you, who maybe even bugged you and you kept your distance from. Maybe they're a different ethnic race or a different social status or something, but they were, there were things, there were differences that kept you as strangers alienated from each other. But now, it's different. You get to know them and the eyes of your heart are open to a different side of them and, and you begin to wonder, it's like, well, what, did, what did I ever have against them before? You begin to appreciate the way that God has gifted them and over time, not only are you no longer strangers and aliens from each other, you are actually friends and partners in ministry. Secondly, still in verse 19, Paul says that we're joined together as part of God's family, that we're now members of the household of God. What that means is that when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he not only gives you the privilege of calling God Father, but he also gives you the opportunity to start calling your fellow Christians brothers and sisters. And it's true, you are now part of a spiritual family that can never be broken. What happens in a healthy family? Well, you, you extend care to one another. And I tell you what, this has been one of the most beautiful things that I've seen happen here at First Lutheran. When I started serving here nine years ago, the Lord, the Lord started to bring, bring together the most unlikely, diverse group of people imaginable. And to be honest, there were differences that I truly wondered if we would be able to come. I used to say, and I hate to admit this, but I used to say that we were a train wreck waiting to happen. Please forgive me. <laughs> But what I discovered is that God's promise to reconcile is so much more powerful than any of our differences. And over time, as we worship together, and as we serve together, and as we study together, I have watched this congregation go from barely knowing each other to actually liking each other to genuinely loving 
each other. And it has been a beautiful thing to see and, and truly only by the grace of God. Lastly, and please stay with me here, Paul says that we are joined together as God's temple. Verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Friends, this is the whole purpose of God, that through Christ, in him, that we would be reconciled to God, that we would be reconciled to each other, that we would be joined together in becoming a holy temple in the Lord in which God lives by his spirit. Now I've heard, I know that you have heard that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that is absolutely true. But most often when the New Testament talks about the temple of God, it's referring to our corporate togetherness, that we are together the temple of the Holy Spirit. Friends, this is why it is so important that we not forego worship. Because when we come together on a Sunday morning to worship God and to sing praises to him together, we are fulfilling his purpose of providing a dwelling place for him, not in a building, but in the people who gather together. That's why we worship every Sunday. It's why we do things like communion and baptism together. You don't do those things on your own. Listen, even as you are watching there on YouTube, that does not mean that you are doing church. You do not do church on YouTube, all right? Church is gathering together as God's people. Jesus said, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there I am with them. We are meant to be joined together. Now, unfortunately, I know because of the restrictions of COVID-19, we have had to forego God's greatest purpose for his people, for them to be together, dwelling together as a holy temple in the Lord, providing a place in which God can dwell by his spirit. Yes, absolutely. By his grace, we are covered during this time. But we need to be praying fervently that the people of God are joined together, that the church of Jesus Christ is together again soon as they were intended to be. So who am I in Christ? I am reconciled. Where I was once alienated from God and from others, I am now reconciled through the blood of Christ who breaks down the walls of hostility, making peace with God and peace with one another, together a temple of the Lord in which God can live. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we are so grateful, Lord, that you came, that you died, that you rose again, that you fulfilled all of the, the Old Testament laws, that had a tendency to separate people from one another. God, thank you for tearing those walls down through your death on the cross. God, I pray um, that you would continue to reconcile us to you, to one another. I pray especially for those who do not know you as Lord and Savior. And God, I pray that for right now, if anybody is watching or listening and the Holy Spirit is tugging at their heart. Lord, I pray that you would just shower them with your love and your grace, that you would cause them to just surrender their heart, mind, and will to, the, to your lordship in their life, that they can feel the, the greatest love, the greatest peace, the greatest inclusion of, with you and your people. And then, God, I just pray that you bring them into the body of a local church, where they can live that newfound faith out. Lord, for those of us who are already in the church, we ask that you would help us to remember what it felt like to be alienated from you and to rejoice for what you have done in our lives and to be sensitive, Lord, to those around us, God, who feel alienated for one reason or another. 
Lord, your word says that they'll know that we are Christians by our love, and part of that is reaching out to those, not within our circle, but outside of our circle. God, reaching out to those who are different than us to bring them into your household of faith, to work side by side with them for the benefit and the glory of your kingdom, that your name might be known throughout the earth, that others would see Jesus as their Lord and Savior, be reconciled to you, Lord, and to be reconciled with us, the body of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we just continue to lift up to you this uh, COVID-19 circumstance, and especially as we um, start bringing things together to bring things somewhat back to normal in all areas of our life, whether it be education, um, retail, sales, medical, and most definitely our place of worship, Lord God. We pray that you would give us all wisdom, sensitivity, grace, um, recognizing that we are all at different places in this, God. But together, um, we are your body. And so use us together to help move this forward. Lord, we pray for that day that you will come and remove all disease um, and sin and evil from this earth. But until that day comes, you have called us to be your light and your life in this world. So help us to be that by your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We continue to pray for our farmers, God, as they fin finish up planting. We pray that the start of this season would be good and safe, Lord God. We, we pray that you would send the right amount of rain and sunshine and wind to um, make the planting start to grow and give our farmers some rest from their labors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also lift up those in our uh, in and around us uh, who are fighting for our safety, those on the front lines, Lord God, our law enforcement, our emergency workers, our medical staff. God, be with them as they continually fight for safety in our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we lift up those among us who are in need of healing. We thank you for what you have done, uh, what you are doing, and what you continue to do for Bobby, Pastor Dave, Mary, Steve, Gary, Pastor Jeff, Roxanne, and those that we now name in the silence of our hearts. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would send your spirit, that you would use whatever means possible to bring healing to their bodies, minds, and spirits. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we lift up all of these prayers to you, knowing that we can lift them up boldly because we are reconciled to you, we are reconciled to each other. And by your Holy Spirit, you direct us, you guide us, you hear our prayers, and you answer in your perfect will. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. I will invite you at this time to gather up your communion elements as we go into a time of communion. In light of the message that we just heard, what a, what a wonderful thing to celebrate. The only thing that could make it better is that we, that we would be here together. Um, but the gift, the sacrament of Holy Communion, is just exactly what we've been talking about today. In and through it, God reconciled us to himself through the very real presence of Jesus Christ and the elements of the bread and the wine. And he reconciles it, us to each other as we share in this sacrament together. And in and through it, he joins us together as his temple in purpose and in mission for his glory. And so it is that we remember. We remember in the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, that he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to 
all to drink, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, remember me. And together we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I'll invite my husband, Steve, to come on up now as we share in communion together. Steve, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Through the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have been strengthened in your spirit, reconciled to God, reconciled to one another, and joined together as the temple of the living God. You have been assured of the forgiveness of your sins. Go in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. And as we go from this place, go with God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord's countenance be upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.